Hello, welcome to our interview for this week in Wisdom uh, from World Religions. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to, uh, to our course um, uh, uh, Dr. Nathan Katz, Distinguished Professor at uh, Florida International University. Uh, and uh, Professor Katz uh, has uh, numerous research interests, including Tibetan Buddhism, worldwide Jewry, India and Judaism, Jainism, Hinduism, Dr. Katz is uh, and, uh, Nathan. Dr. Katz is a is a in, is a, a, a worldwide traveler, a person who knows Asia and India in particular, inside and out. Leads tours all over India. Uh, just recently back from Israel, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, a Dr. Katz, Nathan, in India back in 1987 when we were staying uh, at an ashram, a place called the Ramakrishna Mission, uh, inst an institute for culture, I believe it was called in Kolkata. So it's, it's great, after all these years, to be able to talk again, uh, Professor Katz. Dr. Rose, how are you today? Nice to be with you. I'm doing very nicely. Um, so um, I'll get right to our questions for the day. Um, oh, let me just say a few of the words that, uh, pro that, that Nathan, Professor Katz, is the author and editor of numerous books and articles. I couldn't possibly include all of them here, such as Who Are the Jews of India? Uh, the Last Jews of Cochin, Jewish Identity in Hindu India with uh, Ellen Goldberg, uh, your wife, um, Buddhist Images of Human Perfection, um, Spiritual Journey Home, Eastern Mysticism to the Western Wall, Buddhist and Western Philosophy, um, Teach Us to Count Our Days, Indo-Judaic Studies, Studies of India, and on and on the list goes, uh, and of, of course the, the books on Buddhism and Western Psychology. So. Uh, this leads to uh, a question that, of course, I'm curious about. As a scholar of Indian religion, because I believe this is your academic expertise, training in Tibetan Buddhism uh, and Buddhism and, and Hinduism, um, but you're also a scholar of world Jewry. Uh, in, India is central to your work in life. Uh, can you tell us how this India, uh, India and Judaism connection arose? The India-Judaism connection in particular, surely. Um, I was on a sabbatical grant, and it was 1983-84. Uh, as you know, Ken, my uh, PhD is in Buddhist studies, and I was there busy in Sri Lanka uh, researching the political engagements of Sri Lankan Buddhist monks. In the middle of the year, we, uh, my wife and I thought, we need a little break. Uh, and I said, you know, just not far from here in a town called Cochin, now called Kochi, there's an ancient Jewish community I'd heard about. So um, why not? it's very pretty there. Let's go and see Kerala and let's meet some of the Jews in South India. We did. And this was the start of an absolutely transformative journey for the two of us. Uh, we uh, were there for a week or so. We met the Jews. Uh, we feel we got to know them a little bit that quickly, and knowing that my wife is a foreign correspondent journalist and I'm a scholar, they suggested, look, there's so much history here, we're already forgetting it, please come back and let the world know who we are and what we've done. And we thought about it, and yeah, it got in my, my blood and my wife's blood that fast, and we agreed. I went back to America, I tried to brush up my childhood Hebrew, uh, read a lot, and two years later, we were back on a senior Fulbright research grant. Mm -hmm. We were there for one year in Cochin. We did participant observation method. That is, we did everything they did. They invited us to live in one of the homes of, the, of a Jewish family. Uh, we were at the synagogue. We had our meals. Our life was more or less confined uh, to Jewtown, as it's called in those days. It's that time uh, that I met you, Ken. We were visiting yes. the synagogues in Kolkata. Um, after we were done, after Shavuot, we decided we would go and visit the resettled Cochin Jews in Israel. We went to Mumbai, and I'm thinking, my gosh, I can't wait. I know these great seafood restaurants. I'm going to eat shrimp. I'm going to eat lobster. This is wonderful. We sat down at my favorite seafood restaurant in Mumbai. I opened the menu, and I couldn't order it. I just couldn't make the words for my mouth. Give me shrimp. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. I started laughing. I think the weight person thought I was a little nuts. But I realized instantaneously what happened to me without my knowledge, traditional Judaism, 
had um, gone that. into my blood, and uh, we knew in that instant that now we were going to be observant Jews. Um, you know, Nathan, that's really a great story. And of course, I've been reading some of your stories. I, there's so many directions I could go. But uh, how is it that someone like you, I mean, you were raised in a traditional conservative Orthodox Jewish background. Why did you not just study Judaism from the beginning? And secondly, how is it that your study of Tibetan Buddhism and your engagement with figures like the Dalai Lama led you to re-embrace your <laughs> Orthodox roots? Yeah, I don't know how I got first involved is the truth of the matter. Uh, my mother, may she rest in peace, told a story one Friday evening. I came to the Shabbat table. I was five years old, and I said, I have, a, I have an announcement my family. What is this? I said, in my first opportunity, I'm going to India. Hmm. I have no idea where they came from. I have no memory of that event. But if my mother told me, it has to be true. Uh, and I did, on my first opportunity, go to India. I think I was 20 years old at the time. Uh, it was also the other, the external reason is this was the 1960s. Mm. It was a time when gurus abounded, where everyone was sick and tired of traditional authority, wanted something new. Uh, I happened to pick up, I was about 18, I picked up the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which may be the most influential book I've read in my life. It fascinated me so that I made a vow to myself, I had to read this in the original language in order to understand it. Okay, so that set me off in Tibetan trajectory because it takes years to learn the language. I was off to India, okay. studying Tibetan in various centers, uh, and... Um, I had the great, great honor of meeting His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1973. He's been an important person, to say the least, in my life. Uh, so as anti-establishment, that yeah. was good. And it also revived, rekindled in me uh, my own spirituality that I had experienced as a child in synagogues. But with the 60s, it all fell away. Yes. Uh, so I guess you are one of the uh, founding members of what has become known as the, the Jubu group. So yes. what's Jubu? <laughs> <laughs> Jewish Buddhist. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the word was coined, I believe, uh, by author Roger Kamenitz in his book, uh, The Jew in the Lotus, which chronicled uh, a dialogue uh, meeting with the Dalai Lama and selected Jewish leaders. I was selected because I could speak the language somewhat. Uh, Yes. Um, you know, uh, Nathan, you, you point out, you write that, uh, that Jews have lived in India for millennia without a trace of anti-Semitism. And I think many of our viewers will be surprised to hear how deep and rich and how harmonious Jewish experience in India has been. Can you say something about that history? Yeah, of course. Harmonious, first of all. Uh, the Jews in Cochin told us the word anti-Semitism does not exist in our Indian dictionary. Mm -hmm. And it's quite true. There was no indigenous anti-Semitism on Indian soil ever. Uh, there had the Portuguese weren't always nice to us. The British weren't always nice. And these days the jihadis are certainly not nice to us in India. But in traditional India has this view that all religions are good. Uh, they most believe all religions lead to the same goal, but different paths. Mm -hmm. So what I found in India is that if you have some symbols, something recognizably religious, people love you, people respect you. Mm -hmm. uh, I wear one of these and uh, on a train, walking in the city, oh, oh, are you from Israel, sir? I said, well, no, I'm an American Jew. Oh, I've never spoken with a Jew. I've always wanted to learn something about your people. Please, let me get you a cup of tea. Let's talk. Uh, and that's the attitude. It is one of respect, of an open-minded curiosity, and one of a deep friendship that I've always experienced in India. And that, to me, is the hook that gets people interested in Indian Jewish communities. That's not been the case anywhere else uh, for more than a thousand, perhaps as long as two thousand, uh, and for even unlikely but possibly longer than that, there's been Jewish presence in India. And, and why is it then today that the Jewish presence seems to have declined? It's, it's virtually gone. They're the only Jewish community of any size is in Mumbai, who has about 5,000 people, give or take. But Mumbai has, Lord knows, 23 million people, so we're hardly a powerful force. Um, 
They How about Israelis today, Israelis and uh, Jewish Israelis and Jewish Americans, are they maybe in some, or European uh, replenishing the ranks, if you will? Not replenishing. Uh, I, when I write about it, they're the most recent uh, Jewish quasi-community in India. There are mm -hmm. about half a dozen or more very distinct Jewish communities. Chabad has a presence in some places. Uh, Israelis have set up uh, falafel stands or they get yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of people have noted, and scholars as well, that strong resemblances between uh, Hinduism, particularly the, uh, the Brahminical traditions and, and, and traditional Judaism. Well, there, yeah, sorry. there are two things we can say about that, yes. Yeah. One are the philosophical and ritual affinities, uh, which are very real, which have been studied. And the way I understand that is that there are two kinds of religion, and it's not Eastern, Western. It's old and relatively new. Mm. And old religions, like Hinduism and like Judaism, of necessity share much in common. An old religion is a social theory, is a theory of aesthetics, of medicine, of spirituality, of everything else. Mm -hmm. Newer religions are breakaways, such as Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam. Mm -hmm. These break away from the older religions, and they focus on one of those activities, often spirituality, and they don't need to do anything about social theory and cosmology because that already exists. So the older religions have a lot in common with Hindus, our marriage ceremonies, the fact we have a, a dietary restrictions, uh, and down in the details of life. I don't know if it's direct influence, I think not, it's just those are the things that old, old religions do. I see, yes, that, that really makes sense. So perhaps even older forms of Christianity, such as Orthodox uh, Christianity and Catholicism, more than Protestantism, could have a little bit more of a complete system of life. Yeah, but Protestantism has a lot to do with modern Hinduism. Uh, oh. Protestantism directly influenced uh, uh, from the middle of the 19th century on how under British rule uh, Hinduism evolved. Um, so, uh, so then, c can you say a few words uh, about uh, how uh, has ha have have Judaism has Judaism uh, affected Hinduism or or Buddhism or Jainism in India? Any discernible influence? Well, yes. But it's much thinner. The bigger influence is from the large society into the tiny society. Uh, but that, back to that Jew and the Lotus visit. Mm -hmm. The Dalai Lama said, I want to know the Jewish secret for how a people, especially a small people, can survive in exile. Tibetans have been in exile about 70 years since the Chinese invasion. We were in exile for nearly 2,000 years from the destruction of the Second Temple to the establishment of Israel. How did you do it? Mm -hmm. uh, so there are eight of us in the delegation. We all had never really been asked that question before from an interested party, and we uh, struggled. We stretched ourselves to give our best answers, and the Dalai Lama took that away. And some of the things we said have been institutionalized in Tibetan Buddhist community, uh, most have not, but just that idea, Jews know how to preserve. That. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me personally, uh, there's nothing that is greater evidence for the existence of God than the continued existence of the Jewish people. Well, that's an argument that goes back to the rabbis, yes, and the Talmud. I, I teach that a, a passage from, from the Talmud uh, in some of my intro classes on Judaism. That seems to be a great argument for God's existence. Um, so. Um, uh, and they know it. The Hindus yeah. and Buddhists know it. So, excuse me? The Got Hindus it. and Buddhists know that argument. Um, yes. Uh, you also point out that when Jewish people see themselves through, say, uh, the idea, I, uh, I, eyes of Tibetans, you have a completely different experience than when you're seen through Christian or, or other eyes. There is no question from a personal point of view that's one of the greatest takeaways. Uh, not only Tibetan Buddhists, but most Hindus as well, they see us with respect and affection. Mm. In Christendom and in the Islamic uh, caliphates, maybe we were tolerated, maybe we're not. Mm. But we're certainly never admired uh, and, and, and the recipient of such love, except maybe with contemporary evangelicals in America. Yes. But by and large, what we see reflected back in them changes how we see ourselves. You know, you're also an expert on Jainism. Can, can you say something about Jainism? For, uh, we have an audience, by the way, uh, most people have actually not heard of Jainism, which would be surprising to religion scholars, I guess. But, but yeah, well, Jainism, is very, 
Jains is very little, very yes. tiny religion. There are fewer Jains than there are Jews in the world. Mm -hmm. And they tend, from Western perceptions, to get lost among all the Hindus because mm -hmm. there's not a great visible or obvious difference between the two. Uh, Jainism yes. is one of the absolute smallest religions of the world. Judaism is also among the smallest. And the two religions may be small, but they've been profoundly influential. Mm. Each has brought an idea, a spiritual concept, into the world that has spread wild, widely. For example, the Jewish, of course, idea of monotheism directly affected immediately Christianity and Islam. That, yes. that they are also monotheists in our tradition. But more than that, monotheism even gets uh, explained in Hinduism a, a, as really what Hinduism is about. That's yes. the story. Um, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my track, Ken. Can you... Uh... Yeah, and so with Jainism, the central idea, many would be the most influential... Nonviolence. Nonviolence. Ahimsa. And the Sanskrit uh, word is? Ahimsa. non Hard. Uh, that is the central teaching of Jainism. It is the most emphasized and most dictates their everyday life. Mm -hmm. And it got accepted everywhere from the Buddha accepted it, some Hindus accepted it, Dr. King accepted it, uh, Tolstoy accepted it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a world changing idea, just as the Jewish idea of monarchy. It seems that it even shaped, uh, uh, you know, mainstream Indian religions early yes. on. Brahmanism was not a, a, a vegetarian religion early on. No. Uh, of course, nonviolence pervades every life choice, every moment of a Jane's life. How well, do I not accumulate negative karma, which results from, uh, from violence? Karma sticks to the soul. It's like, like tar mm. and keeps the soul down in this world and prevents it from rising above the world. Yes, in somewhere else, some heavens uh, to be with God, however we understand it. So uh, it's the central practice, it's the central philosophy, and we knew about nonviolence. We probably knew the world, even the word ahimsa, long before we heard the word. Heard exactly. the word. It, it, it precedes it globally. Um, you know, our time slowly is running, and I have two questions I still want to ask, and one is very academic. And as a scholar of, of, of Indian traditions and as a practicing uh, Jew, how do you bring together those two thought worlds? Let's say, let's take two great examples, say Shankara, the Hindu theologian philosopher, and Rambam or Maimonides. How do you bring those together? Okay, first point, I believe... Uh, based on texts, based on personal relations, uh, that Hinduism is monotheistic. Uh, the chief rabbinate of Israel affirmed that in 2007 and again in 2008 after they spoke with swamis. So, uh, given that. So, Rambam and Shankara are, in my view, the greatest rational mystics in the history of the world. Uh, uh, rational and mystic, you can't be both of them. Of course you can. A rational mystic is one for whom that intuitive experience uh, of oneness is the core of the faith. That oneness is, now here there are same words, same words, God, the highest reality, is attributeless. There's nothing we can say coherently about God transcending the physicality, transcending our language, transcending our thoughts. So what you do in both Shankara's tradition and the Rambam's tradition is you get rid of false ideas and you're left with this indescribable, ineffable oneness. I, I, I think, I, I once had a graduate student, a poor guy, he was learning some Sanskrit. He, got, I, he took a course with somebody else on Rambam. He got fascinated. He says, Professor, can I do a dissertation or a thesis on the two? I said, yeah, well, you got to learn Hebrew as well as Sanskrit. Yes. He was game, but uh, I learned. Never allow a student to work on a project that is really beyond what you could expect of them. He, he, right. Those, the, those two language uh, traditions are, are really wide apart. Uh, but that's a fascinating uh, co uh, correspondence that you, that you, you, you described there. You know, I think a lot of people in an introductory setting like this tend to think of Hinduism as having a lot, you know, it's polytheistic. And sure. this seems to run counter to that idea, especially with the conversation with the, with the rabbis and the, and the sannyasins or the, the pundits in, in, in Israel. Yes. Uh, any, can you say something about how to, to allay the idea or to overcome oh, the idea that Hinduism is just a form of polytheism? Yeah, I'll give you two little hints at it. Um, 
Rabbi Alan Brill, one of my colleagues, uh, came across a traveler's diary from around the year 1000. The rabbi went to India and talked to people there and, and, and learned about them. And he saw, of course, all these, what we would call God statues, idols, whatever mm. bad word we have for them, all over the place. And he found out that the name for what's represented is called a deva, or God, mm. or divinity, or divine, that, that basic uh, root. However, whereas everyone else in history has translated Deva as God with a small d, this rabbi translated as angel. Uh. Now, that one shift changes yeah. absolutely everything. We have angelology. We have no problem uh, going to an angel to, uh, to be our conduit to God. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the same way, Hindus go to these Devas in order to... Uh, worship uh, in order to seek favors and communicate, experience the one true reality they call Brahman. Sure. Angels, devas, yes. that's a key. Sure. That's it does a key. seem to be, I mean, angelology, we have that in Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Islam, uh, uh, traditional Christianity. Uh, you know, one thing, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by your first journey. It seems like you, you took passage to Morocco and then found your way to India. Can you tell us about that epic journey? The moment I graduated from college, I took a, a, a freighter, a Yugoslavian freighter, landed in uh, Tangier, and I was free. I saved up a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand bucks, which in those days was a yes. lot. Uh, I bought an old, it's, it's, it, it's a stereotype, I bought an old Volkswagen van and set off through Europe all the way across uh, wow. to India. Uh, I got as far as Afghanistan and my money was running out, so... Yeah. I found a job there with the with the State Department, uh, basically as an English language education consultant to the Royal Afghan Ministry. Spent two years there, learned the language, and studied with Sufis. Uh, wow. Two years with the State Department. I, I didn't want to be with the government anymore. Yes. Uh, I love studying with the Sufis. My heart was always with the Tibetan Buddhists since I read that Tibetan Book of the Dead. I went off to India, spent a year getting started in the language, came back to a graduate program. Uh, so there didn't... I Two huge professional shifts in my life. One was deciding to learn Indian languages and, and go to graduate school in Indology. Uh, and the other was when I shifted my, my, my whole research trajectory, still as an untenured professor, thank God for my wife. She encouraged me to get away from studying Buddhist texts and, and et cetera, et cetera, so much as yes. go since my heart was there to study Indian Jewish communities. Yes, excellent. Um, uh, Professor Katz, uh, as we just as get ready to close, would you, since you're, in, you're, in, you're a great traveler and you know this part of the world well, would you like to say a few words about uh, your foundation for remote Jewish communities in India, my second home? <laughs> I'd love to. Uh, yes. My wife and I lead uh, Jewish interest, Sabbath observing, kosher tours, of Jewish sites in India. Not only Jewish sites, we'll meet the Jews of India, as we put it, and their neighbors. So we not only do it in synagogues and have a meal with a Jewish family, we also go into Jain temples, Hindu temples, mm -hmm. Muslim masjids, a Buddhist temple, and we meet with people there and we talk with them. And if it's a vegetarian place, we'll have a meal with them as well. So we go to Mumbai, to Cochin, to Kolkata, mm -hmm. to Delhi, and then we hop down to Agra for a couple of days because everyone needs to see right. Taj Mahal. On that first trip to India, yes. Um, Professor, yes. yes. Now, the person who started this up, the travel agency, began the Foundation for Remote Jewish Communities. Mm -hmm. And of the charge uh, for, the, for the trip, $900 is a tax-deductible donation. And we try to help Jewish communities. There's oh. one remote one of very poor Jews. We bought every family a water buffalo because that's subsistence living. Yes. Next, we bought every child a bicycle so they could get to school during the day because... It was far away. So we, try, we, we, we raise money and we do things that we believe are significant to help remote Jewish communities. Excellent. Is there anything that I've that I perhaps not covered that you'd like to add before we close? Just that uh, this rapprochement, this love affair between India and Israel on the one hand and between Hindus and Jews on the other hand today is rooted it's not just the end of the Cold War. It's not just exigency and profit. It goes back thousands of years mm. when Jews and Hindus and other Dharmic religions have, have been brothers and sisters, have always gotten along with affection. So 
That's that's the biggest takeaway. 